Now in our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1175 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL Board of Directors establishes a program to cover the initial FCC license fee for new amateurs, 18 years old or younger, that are coming into the service. The ARRL responds to a story we told you about last week concerning a Florida amateur who was accused of interfering with a neighbor's insulin pump. We will have the new details. The Hurricane Watch Net and the VOIP Hurricane Net funnel a ton of ground truth data to the National Hurricane Center during Hurricane Ida. The FCC grants a temporary waiver to permit higher symbol rate data transmissions for Hurricane Ida traffic on HF. The Federal Emergency Management Agency announces HF interoperability activity exclusively for hurricane relief traffic on 60 meters, Channel 1 for voice and Channel 2 for data transmissions. We will have the details. The FCC is investigating interference on 40 meters allegedly coming from Cuba. We will have the details on that. Scientists say that high cycle 25 solar flares could potentially interfere with internet traffic on undersea cables. And... Purdue University says goodbye to dots and dashes on recorded CDs and DVDs with a new enhanced way to store data optically. All that and a lot more is straight ahead on today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about the recent announcement from Microsoft that it will be making the migration to Windows 11 easier on older equipment. He will wish the Linux operating system a happy 30th anniversary, and he will tell us that the 10-digit number dialing system goes into effect nationwide in October. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will tell us what you have to do to take your shack mobile. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to the end of World War I and how difficult it was for amateurs to reassemble their stations and finally get back up on the air. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about the problems you may encounter when the only available space on the tower for your vertical antenna forces you to mount it upside down. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in sunny but cool, fall is definitely in the air, in Albany, New York. I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio outpost in the Catskill Mountains of western New York, where the garden tomatoes, peppers, and pumpkins are overrunning the place, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the temperatures are starting to cool off, but the bugs are still hot and heavy. I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where the weather rock is very, very dry these days, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off this week's news, the ARRL Board of Directors has formally endorsed a proposed program calling on ARRL to cover the $35 application fee for licensed candidates younger than 18 years old. With more details on this latest initiative by the ARRL, we go to League Headquarters where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. The FCC is not expected to implement the $35 application fee schedule until sometime in 2022. The board approved the Youth Licensing Grant Program 
at its July meeting in Windsor, Connecticut. The program concept, first raised at the board's annual meeting in January, was reviewed by an ad hoc committee, which expanded the scope of the original motion made by ARRL Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker and 4MB. Under the program, ARRL would cover a one-time $35 application fee for each qualified candidate who passes one or more amateur radio exams taken on the same day at a single examination. Tests would have to be administered by a volunteer examiner team working under the auspices of the ARRL volunteer examiner coordinator. Qualified candidates would also pay a reduced exam session fee of $5 to the ARRLVEC. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Goals of the program include expanding the reservoir of trained operators, technicians, and electronics experts within the amateur radio community and removing a financial obstacle to young people who wish to acquire an amateur radio license as a means of encouraging potential careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The new program also would enhance the ARRL's position as the leader in volunteer testing, the board motion said. The board believes that the recruitment and training of young amateur radio operators is a necessary and proper mission of the ARRL and that subsidization of the $35 fee will reduce the number of new amateurs that otherwise would be lost from these groups, the board said. The board said ARRL headquarters staff would determine the method of qualifying applicants and instruct volunteer examiner teams, giving the teams flexibility to determine that a candidate is eligible for reimbursement in the absence of documented proof. The board envisioned that the VEC would pay the FCC directly. The new program initially would serve up to 1,000 new license applicants younger than 18 years old. The motion gave ARRL staff complete latitude to determine how payment is delivered to the FCC or to reimburse eligible applicants. The program length is indefinite. It may be renewed or terminated by the Administration and Finance Committee or by the Board of Directors. The motion carried with applause from board members. The ARRL has responded to an Orlando, Florida news story on August 23, 2021, by WFTV Channel 9, alleging a radio amateur was told to remove his antenna by the management of his subdivision following a complaint made by a neighbor. The news story appears to stem from a two-year-old complaint from a neighbor who believed her insulin pump had malfunctioned due to the radio amateur's operation a few doors down, said ARRL laboratory manager Ed Hare, W1RFI. The story is lacking any details or timeline, so I contacted the radio amateur involved for information and volunteered ARRL's assistance. Hare explained that medical devices such as insulin pumps are regulated by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration specifically for electromagnetic compatibility purposes and are expected to be capable of operating in all the RF environments likely to be encountered by consumers. The Food and Drug Administration published guidance for its staff and industry defines electromagnetic compatibility with respect to electrically powered medical devices as the ability of a device to function safely and effectively in its intended electromagnetic environment, including immunity to electromagnetic disturbance or interference. FDA review of EMC information submitted with a device for approval is based on the risk associated with EMC malfunction or degradation of the device under review, as well as the use of appropriate FDA recognized standards or appropriate consensus standards. Hare noted there is an FDA recall for the model number of the insulin pump in question in approximately the same time frame. But with so few details, there is no way of knowing whether that recall applies to the serial number used or whether the exact unit has the mechanical defect indicated in the recall notice that could cause the malfunction, explained Hare. It also became apparent that there is no actual evidence connecting the amateur's transmissions to operation of the insulin pump. Hare was told that the amateur agreed to run tests to establish whether there was a cause and effect, but the neighbor declined. Hare commented, while there are no requirements for a radio amateur to stop transmitting due to alleged interference to a non-radio device, the preferred path with any complaint is for neighbors to work together. 
The Hurricane Watch Net and the VOIP Hurricane Net were busy gathering ground truth weather observations from radio amateurs as Hurricane Ida slammed into the Louisiana Gulf Coast on August 29th as a powerful Category 4 storm. With more details on the amateur radio response during the hurricane, and now with the ongoing relief efforts, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service Teams in Mississippi also activated. For the hurricane watch net, it was all hands on deck, said net manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV. For Ida, we had uh, right at uh, 30 uh, hams that uh, uh, checked in with us, and majority of them they kept coming back uh, uh, at least every hour, giving us updates. Uh, of course, we started up Saturday afternoon, as you know, just lining up reporting stations uh, throughout the affected area, uh, so we know ahead of time who they are, and it would save us time on entering data into our uh, database that we use. And then, of course, on uh, Sunday when we went to full action, you know, here comes the storm. Ida wrought extensive damage, especially in Louisiana and Mississippi, and left some one million customers in New Orleans and elsewhere without power and some communities without water. All told, the Hurricane Watch Net was activated for 26 hours over the weekend. The VOIP Hurricane Net activation for Hurricane Ida wrapped up on Monday, August 30th after handling dozens of reports from stations in the affected area that were sent to WX4NHC, the National Hurricane Center amateur radio station, the Mississippi Aries Emergency Net, and the Mississippi Windlink Net activated on August 29th, passing 80 messages to KM5EMA at the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Downgraded to a tropical depression, Ida continued its path up the eastern seaboard, the National Hurricane Center said on Wednesday, with the threat of considerable heavy rain and flooding continuing to spread from the Tennessee and Ohio valleys into the central and southern Appalachians and the mid-Atlantic states. The Hurricane Watch Net initially activated on Saturday for six hours to line up reporting stations across southern Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, as well as parts of northeastern Texas. This allowed the reporting stations to double-check their equipment, as well as our net control stations to log their backup capability and, if available, what kind of weather station Hurricane Watch Net Manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, explained. This saves time the next time they check in. All we have to do at that point is enter the weather data and send it off to the National Hurricane Center. All told, the Hurricane Watch Net logged 26 hours of activation time over the weekend, fielding reports ranging from mild winds to very high winds and torrential rainfall. A Davis Online weather station in Grand Isle, Louisiana, recorded a wind gust of 146 miles per hour before the instrument malfunctioned as Ida roared ashore. VOIP Hurricane Net Manager Rob Macedo, KD1CY, said, citing one extreme report. Another Davis weather station on an oil platform near Pilot Town, Louisiana, recorded a wind gust of 119 miles per hour. Macedo said these and other reports were sent to WX4NHC, the National Hurricane Center amateur radio station. Macedo said radio amateurs on the N50ZG repeater system provided constant ground truth from areas in and around New Orleans, with N50ZG relaying numerous reports of damage to trees, power poles, and structures, as well as flooding. Many other amateurs on the N50ZG repeater system provided ground truth into the VOIP hurricane net despite dealing with direct and significant impacts to their communities and property, Macedo said, and we are forever grateful for their support and the continued partnership we have had with their team since 2008 and Hurricane Gustav. All of these reports were also sent to WX4NHC, the amateur radio station at the National Hurricane Center. Net control stations across the U.S. also assisted with reporting and monitoring of weather stations, social media outlets, and public safety outlets, 
reaching out to contacts in the affected area to relay reports of storm damage to WX4NHC. The team did a tremendous job providing a constant data flow for situational awareness, Macedo said. The peak of the Atlantic hurricane season is not until mid-September. The VOIP Hurricane Net Management Team will continue to monitor all developments in the tropics. The Mississippi Section Aries Team activated on August 29th with several nets. Southeast Mississippi District Emergency Coordinator Justin Gleason, KF7DLW, was contacted by WDAMTV in Moselle, Mississippi, to set up a station that would be available to help keep WDAM personnel updated on Ida's progress through the Hurricane Watch Net and VOIP traffic, state traffic, and digital nets in the event of a power or internet outage at WDAM. On Sunday, August 29th, VHF Aries nets were activated around the state for the purpose of passing weather reports, health and welfare traffic, and damage reports as needed. ARRL Mississippi Section Manager Malcolm Kuhn W5XX, and Section Emergency Coordinator Robert Hayes, KC5IMN, requested the Mississippi Aries Emergency Net be activated at 1600 on Sunday. The net stood down later the same day. The Mississippi Windlink Net was activated August 29th by Assistant Section Emergency Coordinator for Digital Operations Mark Williams, W5DIX. The net operated until 1800 on August 30th, passing 80 messages which were copied to KM5EMA, the Windlink Station at the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. Given the sometimes degraded band conditions, the digital team was still able to perform sending traffic from Gulf Coast stations to served agencies and state nets as needed. Mississippi Public Information Coordinator Caleb Rich, K5RFL, said, while Mississippi avoided major catastrophe, the Aries team were well equipped and prepared to provide the communication support that we count on them for. In an August 30th order, the Federal Communications Commission granted a temporary waiver sought by the ARRL to facilitate relief communications related to Hurricane Ida. With more on the waiver request, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. The waiver also applies to relief communications directly related to any future hurricane within 60 days. The waiver permits radio amateurs handling hurricane relief communications on HF to use any protocol that would comply with the FCC's rules, except in terms of symbol rate limits. In its request, ARRL said that Section 97.307F of the FCC Amateur Radio Rules prevents the use on HF of certain protocols capable of higher data rate emissions that many amateur stations are capable of using while active in emergency communications preparedness. ARRL asserted that higher data rates can be critical to timely transmission of relief communications, such as lists of needed and distributed supplies. ARRL noted that radio amateurs are working with federal, state, and local emergency management officials to assist communications efforts. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. On August 28th, the FCC orally granted ARRL's request to immediately facilitate relief of communications related to Hurricane Ida. The FCC has granted temporary waivers in the past to allow faster protocols to be used for disaster relief communication, including Hurricane Laura, Hurricane Maria, Typhoon Relief Communications in Hawaii, and Hurricane Dorian. The Commission noted that the waivers are necessary because of Section 97.307, Subpart F, lifts the symbol rate at which the carrier waveform amplitude, frequency, and or phases vary to transmit information for HF amateur radio teletype data transmissions to 300 baud for frequencies below 28 MHz, except on 60 meters, and 1200 baud on 10 meters. 
The digital code used to encode the signal being transmitted must be one of the codes specified in Section 97.309, Subpart A of the FCC's rules. But an amateur station transmitting an RTTY or data emission using one of these specified digital codes may use any technique whose technical characteristics have been publicly documented, such as Clover, GTOR, or PACTOR. We conclude that granting the requested waiver is in the public interest, the FCC said. Hurricane Ida had caused significant damage, including disruption to electricity and communication services. Thus, to accommodate amateur radio operators in assisting with the recovery efforts, the FCC grants ARRL's waiver request for the period of 60 days from the date of this order. The waiver is limited to amateur radio operators in the U.S. and its territories using publicly documented data protocols that are compatible with FCC rules, with the exception of the data rate limit waived here for those directly involved with HF hurricane relief communications. Channels 1 and 2 on 60 meters will be available starting August 30th for interoperability between U.S. government and U.S. amateur radio stations involved in Hurricane Ida emergency communications. This situation will remain in place until the storm has passed and the need for these channels no longer exists or on September 6th, whichever comes first. These frequencies will be used. Channel 1, primary voice traffic 5332 kHz, channel center. 5330.5 kHz, upper sideband voice. And channel 2, digital traffic 5348 kHz, channel center and 5346.5 kHz upper sideband with 1.5 kHz offset to center of digital waveform. Stations on 60 meters are asked to yield to operational traffic related to Hurricane Ida. If you are old enough to remember when amateur radio first went on the air on the International Space Station almost 21 years ago, you can probably appreciate the slow and careful effort that's being made now with respect to NASA's Gateway Project, the multi-purpose station being designed for eventual lunar orbit. The Amateur Radio Exploration Team, an international team of ham radio organizations, is crossing its collective fingers that one day ham radio will be welcome aboard the NASA's Gateway Project in much the same way ham radio eventually ended up on the International Space Station. Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, a co-leader of the team, said RX is cautiously optimistic that at some point one of the modules to be launched later for the gateway may provide some optimal conditions for a ham shack, including access to reliable power from the sun and a good field to view of the earth to enable radio contacts. Even with those conditions met, however, NASA would still have to commit to a ham radio presence on board. Frank went on to say, we are being patient and working with NASA as to what is the best approach. We are just staying engaged. The Gateway's first modules are already earmarked to launch together commercially. Those are the HALO, the astronauts' pressurized living quarters, and the power propulsion element. Frank said that modules to be launched after these first two may provide even richer fields of view of the Earth. Meanwhile, unlike the development of the ARES program on board the ISS two decades ago, he said progress is expected to be intermittent. Despite the increase in digital amateur television across Europe, the popular DATV magazine, CQ DATV, will publish its final edition in September. With more details on the story, we go across the pond to the UK, where Steve Richards, G4HPE, files this report. The free magazine is produced every month by Ian Pawson, Golf 8 India Quebec Uniform, Trevor Brown, Golf 8 Charlie Juliet Sierra, Terry Moles, Victor Kilo 5 Tango Mike, and Jim Andrews, Kilo Hotel 6 Hotel Tango Victor. The editorial in the 99th edition, September 21, says that the team have now been producing the magazine every month for eight years. It's a green publication, produced in electronic format only. Three formats of ebook are provided, and one version of PDF for every issue. There's also an electronic index in the library, which allows a search for all the articles by description and author. Also, the omnibus PDF, which is every issue in one single file. These are all updated after each edition is published. In the eight-year existence of the magazine, there have been in excess of half a million downloads, which makes it the most widely read ATV publication. This is no mean feat for the small production team, who are now all eight years older than when they launched the publication, and this is taking its toll, so issue 99 is the penultimate issue. 
CQDA TV edition number 100 will be published next month, and then the team say they're going to rest the work. They say they've proved the demand is there, they brought the ATV community closer together, and proved that the support of a monthly magazine freely available to everyone is of immense value. The team say that the magazine works, and they'd love to see it continue, but alas, they are, and have been for some time, desperately in need of people to create, produce, contribute, and proofread. They'd hoped that others would join the team, but this hasn't happened. The concept of an electronic-only magazine was an idea from Ian G8IQU, the editor-in-chief. But in order for it to continue, they needed more people to take on the tasks so the team could rotate the workload, and they are sad to say this hasn't happened. The Facebook site will continue. The library will be maintained for at least another 12 months and probably longer. For this, it's a cost that's come out of Ian's personal pocket. The mailing list is still intact, and should something emerge in the future, you'll be contacted via this list or our Facebook, so please join either or both now. The magazines can be downloaded free in EPUB, Mobi, or PDF format. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, let's see, what's going on in the world? But It's good news uh, for Microsoft Windows users who want Windows 11. Remember all the furor over, oh, you can't install it on an older PC, like older, like two years old. You can't install it if you don't have Intel's trusted platform unit, TPU, which gives it security, all of that stuff. Now Microsoft says, well, never mind. <laughs> it says, we're not going to stop you from installing Windows 11 on most older PCs. But there's a little hitch in that giddy up. Most people who want to move to Windows 11 will be upgrading from Windows 10, right? You can't do that. You can't just smoothly upgrade from Windows 10 to 11 unless you're compatible with all of their uh, system requirements. If you want to go to a Windows 11 and you have an older machine that won't upgrade that way, you can download Windows 11 and install it. And it'll still be free and all of that. So Microsoft had really upset people with saying, oh, you got to have an eighth generation or later Intel processor. you got to have TPU. Now they say, and they're, by the way, Microsoft says, we will not recommend or advertise this. So it's up to me to tell you. You have to, oh, by the way, one catch, according to The Verge, Microsoft reached out to tell us about one potentially gigantic catch. Systems that are upgraded this way may not, may not, may not, just may not, be entitled to get Windows updates, even security ones. May not, sounds like they're going to back down on that too. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a, if you were all bummed out that you couldn't get Windows 11, good news, you sort of can. And still unclear about whether, you know, you'll be able to get the, the, the full deal or what. And you apparently won't be able to upgrade it from Windows 10 automatically. Happy birthday to my favorite operating system, Linux. It was 30 years ago today, Linus Torvalds sent out a message. He was a student at the University of Helsinki in Finland. He put a message on a news group. This is back when we had news groups before the World Wide Web, saying, I'm working on the hobby operating system. I don't know if it's going to be, uh, you know, anything. But if you want to try it, August 25th, 1991, he said, yeah. I'm trying this thing. Maybe you'd be interested. <laughs> I love it. It was a very humble start, but you know, he's a humble guy. Now it is the most used operating system in the world. What, Leo? You're saying what? That is not true. It's not the most used operating system in the world. Well, it is because not only uh, is it used on at least half the World Wide Web, when you go to a server, most of the time they're running a version of Linux, but Android is based on Linux. That, yeah, there, there's, the, there's the trick. So there's so many Android phones out there, close to a, more than a billion, I think, that it makes it technically the most used operating system in the world. More than iOS, I think. <laughs> it's close. Uh, more than Windows, again, close. A lot more than Macintosh. He says, hello, everybody out there using Minix, which was a kind of little used operating system. They used it in his university as a teaching operating system. He didn't like it. I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby. Won't be big and professional. <laughs> For 386 and 486 AT clones. Remember, this is 1991. 
This has been brewing since April and is starting to get ready. I'd like any feedback of things people like or dislike in Minix as my OS, my OS re resembles it somewhat. Any suggestions are welcome, but I, I promise, I, I won't promise I'll implement them. He says it's not prodable, which I think is a typo for portable. Little did he know 30 years ago that that message, you know, that's like Plymouth Rock for operators. It's just like the, uh, the Liberty Bell. It's kind of cool. Kind of cool. Going back a little bit in time. So happy birthday, 30th birthday to Linux. What else is going on? A little PSA. Start dialing all 10 digits in the phone number. For a long time, even on your cell phone, some of us, not all of us, I know in some areas you have to dial 10 now, right? Do you, do you have to dial 10? This is not a change for you, but I live in the countryside and I could dial seven digits if I'm calling a local number. Now I'm going to have to dial the full 10 digits, including the area codes, starting, well, it's a, there's a transition. They say, become a, the FCC says, become accustomed to 10 digit dialing now. If you forget and dial seven digits, it'll still work, but become accustomed. Starting October 24th, a couple of months from now, you'll, you'll have to dial 10 digits for local calls. If it's dialed with seven digits, you'll get a recording that'll say, this call cannot be completed as dialed. And then you'll have to hang up and dial again using the area code. This is actually for a good thing, a good reason. But I just thought I'd warn you if you if you so you understand what's going on. Almost every state has area codes that are, that are affected here. I think that these are the states where you could dial seven. I think for many places you you you've had to dial ten for a while. Is that right? It's because they want to have a three digit code. I think this is completely uh, a good idea. Just a little trigger warning here. We're going to talk about something that can be upsetting and even dangerous for people, but they want to have a number. Right now, the number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is an 800 number, 800-273-8255. Nice people, really there to help, but they want to make it even easier, and so they want 988. 988, just like, you know, we have 911 for emergencies, 988 for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It will also uh, be for the Veterans Crisis Line. And uh, I think this is good. Mental health crisis counselors will be on, on, on standing by. But in order to do that, we have to change how the phone system works because it means, I guess, 988. Now, if you maybe there's maybe there's uh, parts of the country where 988 is a, is part of a phone number. I'm not sure. This will apply to all telecommunications carriers, all voice over internet protocol service providers. This has been a two year transition, but the transition is about to transit. Because October 24th, 10 digits. And then July 16th, 2022, 988 will start working. It doesn't work yet, but it will start working in July of next year. You can consult the North American Numbering Plan Administrator for a complete list of affected area codes. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know there was a North American Numbering Plan Administrator. That's a, you think that person like has a desk in the basement and just like a lot of printouts and stuff? Or is it a whole office full of people? I don't know. They have provided a list on the FCC website of area codes that are uh, the 10 digit dialing fact sheet. So get ready. I just, I thought I'd let you know, you know, just a little public service announcement. Start dialing 10 digits. I mean, when I was a kid, in some small towns, you could dial four digits. You didn't even have to dial the exchange. There was, uh, I guess, you know, there's, a th what is that? 10,000 people in the town. See, that actually covers a lot of numbers. I remember getting lost in the woods once with my sister when I was probably eight or nine, and we got we finally found a house. I knocked on the door. Lady, lady, can, can we're lost. Can we call? And she says, yeah, there's the phone over there. Call 6391. I said, what? Even then, big city kid that I was from Pawtucket, we had to dial seven digits. She only had to dial four. Confused me at first. She had to I said, well, I'm sorry, what? Four digits? She had to come over and dial. We we got we're, we got home safe and sound. So I guess in those days, even four digits, long time ago. Now it's ten. Everywhere it's gonna be ten. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip? 
into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. By the time World War I ended in November 1918, almost 5,000 amateurs had served in uniform, with many giving their lives overseas. Amateurs had proven themselves to be invaluable to the war effort. The Army and Navy were faced with an absolute lack of trained radio officers, instructors, operators, and even state-of-the-art equipment. Amateurs stepped in and provided the knowledge, men, and sometimes even the equipment necessary to help win the war. An interesting example of this was the case of Alessandro Fabri, a wealthy yachtsman and radio amateur who had top-notch stations on both his yacht and on Mount Desert Island, Maine. The Navy commandeered the stations, and the yacht, made Fabry an ensign, and placed him in command. Largely with his own money, he expanded his operation and improved his equipment. Fabry's station was used to pass most of the official communications between the battlefronts in Europe and Washington. The traffic often mounted to 20,000 words a day, most of them in cipher. Captain, later Major, Edwin Armstrong, whose regenerative receiver was being used worldwide, was in charge of the Signal Corps' radio laboratory in Paris, where he developed the superheterodyne receiver. Thousands of amateurs served as Navy radio men and Signal Corps operators. It would seem from this information that amateurs had conclusively proven their worth and that the Navy would return the amateurs' frequencies back to them once the war had ended. Sadly, this was not the case. A string of events conspired against the amateur and almost eliminated all privately owned stations. The villain in this play was the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, a puritanical landlubber and teetotaler whose opinions often got him into trouble. He was the type of individual that H. L. Mencken and Sinclair Lewis satirized as one who is terrified that somewhere someone is having fun. For years, he had demanded that the Navy have exclusive control over the radio spectrum. Now it appeared he had his chance. The effects of the first modern global war, along with the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, had temporarily turned the country extremely conservative. It was in this mindset that the Espionage Act of 1918 and Prohibition were passed. Hundreds of suspected communists and anarchists were deported in the Red Scare. Even the great socialist Eugene V. Debs was imprisoned for disagreeing with the government. Seizing the opportunity, Secretary Daniels urged the passage of legislation giving the Navy a monopoly on radio communications. As a result, the Poindexter Bill was introduced in the Senate and the Alexander Bill in the House. Political observers gave both bills an excellent chance of passing. Back at the ARRL, things looked bleak. All memberships had lapsed, along with all amateur licenses. 80% of the amateurs were still overseas. QST had ceased publication. The unpaid printing bill was now $4,700, and there was just $33 in the Treasury. However, action was needed immediately to defeat these bills. Hiram Percy Maxim and the other board members dug into their own personal funds and sent out a blue card appeal to all known amateurs or their families, asking them to write their congressmen and urge the defeat of the bills. It worked. Thousands of letters poured into Washington from amateurs or, more often than not, their family members asking that amateur radio be saved. Congressmen who opposed a military monopoly of the airwaves also joined in, lending their support to amateur radio. Overwhelmed by this grassroots opposition to naval control of the radio spectrum, Congress killed the bills in committee. This 1919 letter-writing campaign had a profound historical impact on all of radio. For, had these bills passed, not only would amateur radio have disappeared forever, but all private communication activities, including broadcasting, business radio, citizens band, GMRS, cellular, etc., either never would have evolved or would have been delayed by years or even decades. With the bills defeated, Maxim and the ARRL Board of Directors issued $7,500 worth of bonds to league members to get QST going again. 
At the same time, pressure was brought on Washington to lift the radio ban and allow amateurs back on the air. Partial success was achieved on April 12, 1919, when the Navy removed the ban on receiving, but not transmitting. Thousands of amateurs and other listeners removed the seals from their receivers, which had been placed there by a government radio inspector, strung up their antennas, and warmed their filaments with the sounds of the government stations. But they wanted more. Their fingers fondled their telegraph keys as they waited for the lifting of the transmitting ban. Finally, in November 1919, after a joint resolution had been introduced in Congress demanding that the Secretary of the Navy remove restrictions on amateur radio, the transmitting ban was lifted, licenses were reissued, and amateurs were back on the air. Now began the second war, Spark versus CW. Remember that amateurs were allowed in effect just one frequency, 200 meters. A spark station on 200 meters actually generated a signal from 150 to 250 meters. With the sensitive regenerative receivers now in use, the practical range was several hundred miles. Transcontinental relays now took less than five minutes. The number of licensed amateur operators stood at 5,719 in 1920, 10,809 in 1921, and 14,179 in 1922, and all were operating on 200 meters. To quote Arthur Lyle Budlong in The Story of the American Radio Relay League, it was interference. Lord, what interference. It was bedlam. Something had to be done. And it was. Various transatlantic tests were conducted from 1921 through 1923. The results overwhelmingly showed CW was far superior to Spark. Post-war vacuum tube production was at its peak. In 1921, an RCA 5-watt tube cost $8, and as a single-tube CW transmitter could outperform a 500-watt Spark station. A 50-watt tube cost $30, and was five times more effective than the best one kilowatt spark station. Since CW took only a fraction of the bandwidth that spark did, over 50 CW stations in the same area could occupy the 150 to 200 meter range versus one spark station. The transatlantic tests also revealed some other interesting facts. Due to the excessive interference on 200 meters, some stations had dropped down to 100 meters where, to their surprise, they found conditions much better. Throughout the 1922 through 1924 period, hundreds of tests and casual contacts were made on the 100 meter wavelength, which conclusively showed not only CW's superiority over Spark, but increased range on the shorter wavelengths. Once again, the scientists came forward and said that long distances on 100 meters were mathematically impossible. And once again, the amateurs proved them wrong. During 1924, Several CW contacts were made at distances exceeding 6,000 miles. On October 19, 1924, a station in England worked New Zealand, a distance of almost 12,000 miles. Amateur communications had now reached halfway around the world. Although it would take a few years to discover the role that the ionosphere had played in shortwave communications, there is no doubt that amateurs pioneered the use of shortwave. The phenomenal success of CW convinced the vast majority of amateurs to buy that vacuum tube. A few still clung to their spark set, screaming, Spark forever! But by 1924, Spark was almost extinct. The 150 to 200 meter region was now orderly, filled with thousands of CW stations living in peaceful coexistence with each other and the occasional Spark renegade. Legally, however, amateurs could not go below 150 meters. True, many were already on 100 meters without a problem, but amateurs wanted a slice of the shortwave spectrum allocated to them. After all, it was amateurs who had discovered the shortwaves. Now, with worldwide interest being shown there, they wanted protection. Negotiations were ongoing with the Department of Commerce to give the amateurs specific frequencies. On July 24, 1924, the Department of Commerce authorized new amateur frequency bands. They were 150 to 200 meters or 1,500 to 2,000 kilocycles, 75 to 80 meters or 3,500 to 4,000 kilocycles, 40 to 43 meters or 7,000 to 7,500 kilocycles, 20 to 22 meters or 
13,600 to 15,000 kilocycles, and 4 to 5 meters, or 60,000 to 75,000 kilocycles. Except for a portion of the 150 to 200 meter band, Spark was prohibited. Spark would survive in the hands of a few rebels until 1927, when it was banned altogether. CW was here to stay. By January 1925, the 80, 40, and 20 meter bands were filling up with amateurs drawn by the promise of transcontinental Daylight DX. Next time, we will check out an amateur with a call of 8XK and his activities on the night of November 2nd, 1920. In the meantime, take a sip of that Prohibition bootleg gin, check out those new shortwave bands, and join us the next time for the Ancient Amateur Archives. Foundations of Amateur Radio When I first started in this hobby, I found myself surrounded by other amateurs who all seemed to have a spare room in their house, or a spare building near their house, or even a property somewhere, dedicated to amateur radio. There was an endless parade of equipment, antennas, tools, workshops, spare parts and the like. Frankly, it was overwhelming. A decade on, I have some perspective to share on that first exposure. For me, the hobby was brand new. I didn't have a family history. There were no amateur friends I'd grown up with, no electronics uncle or anything even remotely resembling any of that. What I was exposed to wasn't a new thing. It represented something that had been going on for years, decades and lifetimes even. It quickly became apparent that having a shack was desirable, but in my case, at the time, unobtainable. So instead I did the next best thing I could think of. I built a shack in my car. That was a journey that took several years to make. At the end of it, I removed my radio from the car and moved it onto a spare table in my office. I have spent countless enjoyable and sometimes frustrating hours in my car shack, and I learned that it's almost always temporary. If you're not the exclusive user of the car, then your shack isn't always available, and in that case it also needs to be family friendly, as in no cables, mounts, brackets and the like that can cause damage to a person or the equipment. This limits the options you have. At the end of my car journey, I had a spare battery in the back, the radio and tuner were mounted under the floor next to the spare tyre, there was an antenna mount attached to the car, there was braiding throughout the car connecting all the body panels together, and the remote control head was detachable from a suction mount that doubled as a mobile phone holder. Antennas, one for HF, one for VHF, were stowed against the roof lining with a strap around the roof hand grab of the rear passenger. An external speaker was mounted below the headrest of the centre rear passenger. What I learned was that this setup was good for short stints, for mobile operation, for contests on the run and for working DX at lunchtime at the beach. Trying to do digital modes, attempting to work a pile-up or doing several other activities I love were not really feasible and as a result I decided to pull it all out. At this point all that remains in the car are the braiding, the control lead, the speaker, the coax and the antenna mount. I plan to rebuild my car shack in the not too distant future, more on that in a moment. I moved house and found myself in an office that was perfect for multiple reasons. It was separate from the rest of the living space so I didn't need to put away stuff, it was big enough to house a dedicated radio table and it's got pretty simple access to the outside world for running coax. It gives me a dedicated place to do radio and have stuff set up permanently. I noticed one thing after having this available. I didn't actually get on air any more than when I was using my car shack. If anything, it's less. I think it's because it's also my office and I already spend plenty of time doing office activities that playing radio isn't all that different. I'm going to keep my setup, but I'm going back to my roots and add a radio back into my car. It's still a family car, so I need to consider the other uses that it's put to, but I think I can make it work. I recently installed an 80 amp hour battery with an automatic charging circuit. It was put there to power the dash cams, but it was scaled with amateur radio in mind. I don't yet know which radio I'm going to put into the car. I really do like my FT857D, but there are other options available to me, so I'm going to experiment. One fundamental change I'm going to make is that the radio will be installed in such a way that it can be easily unplugged and removed. 
Not because I want to remove it from the car, but because I want to be able to go even lighter, take the radio onto the beach, or into a park, or up a summit. I'll likely bolt the whole lot into a Pelican case and make it a mobile go unit that happens to live in my car. I don't think I'll add digital functionality at first, but I'm eyeing off the idea of dedicating an old mobile phone, which is essentially a computer, screen, battery and internet connection in one, to the task, but I'll let you know how that goes. What I do know, with hindsight, is that less is more. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Time now for the AMSAT report. Zero, zero, Our C transition operation procedures to PRCLT 1435, IP units to PRCLT 1457, report anomaly. Please confirm I have no fires on the pad. I have no visual. Please confirm no fires on the pad. Moving ground. Um. I'm looking, I'm at the cinema. The digital Genesis L and Genesis N satellites launched on September 2nd from Vandenberg Air Force Base aboard Firefly's Alpha rocket on its maiden flight. Unfortunately, shortly after launch, the vehicle had to be destroyed. Sad news for AMSAT EA, Spain. Those were the first satellites they built themselves. Move the anomaly team to procedure ML. Several other satellites on Firefly Alpha carried amateur radio payloads. These included Serenity, Hyapo, the Crest Dream Comet, the Cubic 1 and Cubic 2 Pico satellites, and Spinnaker 3. If you're new to satellites, know that satellite endorsements come for several awards from AMSAT, including Worked All States, VUCC, DXCC, and others. AMSAT has a plethora of awards as well, from one for making your very first satellite contact to another for working all the U.S. continental grids. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. And now, with this week's Propagation Forecast Report, we go back to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who reports from League Headquarters. Ted Cook, K7RA in Seattle, our sun watcher, reported on September 2nd that solar activity is on the upswing. Good news, average daily sunspot numbers increased from 21.7 to nearly 51 over the reporting week with a high of 77 on Saturday, August 28th. Average daily solar flux rose from 78.5 to 88. Geomagnetic activity peaked on August 27th and 28th due to a coronal mass ejection, which caused problems for the Hurricane WatchNet. New sunspot regions appeared on August 26th and 27th, and September 2nd saw the emergence of AR-2863. Predicted solar flux looks promising, particularly after mid-September. The autumnal equinox will be on Wednesday, September 22nd in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's always a welcome event for HF propagation. Solar flux is forecast to be higher at that time too, another good sign. Now, something to look out for on the amateur bands. It's a special centenary station, recognizing the first official authorization of an amateur radio station in France. The French National Society, the REF, will be using Tango Mic 100 Alpha Alpha from September the 1st to the 15th, 2021. I thought this little bit of history was quite interesting. The call sign 8 Alpha Alpha was assigned to André Ries on September the 3rd, 1921. André was born in 1894 in Boulogne and was authorised at the age of 27 to use a transmitter of his own construction with a power output of 1 kilowatt. Yes, way back then, a thousand watts. The call sign was changed to become EF8AA, that stood for European France 8AA, in 1927, and then Foxtrot 8 Alpha Alpha in 1932. André joined the REF in August 1927, with the membership number of REF423. He was active until his death on March 2, 1982. Some news briefs for you. The Citrus Belt Amateur Radio Club's 22nd Route 66 on the Air special event, September 11th through the 19th, will deploy 22 stations, including two rovers, 
with call signs W6A through W6V from cities along the highway. Route 66 is famous in American history as the major road from the east to west coasts and is connected with American car culture. A SpaceX Dragon Falcon 9 resupply mission headed for the International Space Station on Sunday, August 29th, carrying several CubeSats, including the first satellite from Puerto Rico, CubeSat NanoRocks 2, or PRCUNAR2, developed by Inter-American University in Bayamón. The satellite will be stowed on board the ISS for future deployment into orbit. Special event call sign SX021I Triple E will be on the air until September 15th from the 26th I Triple E Symposium on Computers and Communications in Athens, Greece. Members in the Valencia area of the Spanish National Amateur Radio Society, URE, will be activating the special event call sign Echo Golf 5 Delta India Charlie to celebrate International Chocolate Day. International Chocolate Day is on September the 13th. Activity will take place starting from 10 hours UTC on Friday, September the 10th until 23.59 hours UTC on Sunday, September the 19th. Operations will be on various HF bands 80 to 10 meters using CW, single sideband and the digital mode FT8. A downloadable special diploma and award PDF is available. Go to Echo Golf 5 Delta India Charlie on QRZ.com for details. And QSL is via the Bureau. In England, Ed Mike Zero Mike November Golf will be active as Golf Bravo Zero Kilo Sierra Sierra from Little Hampton in support of Air Ambulance Kent Surrey Sussex during the International Air Ambulance Week. The Air Ambulance website is at www.aaks.org.uk. Ed plans to be active throughout the whole event, starting Saturday, September the 4th, until the following Sunday, September the 12th. Activity will be mostly on 40 metres, single sideband, above 7.1 MHz, although he will appear on the higher HF bands if they're open. If you work this station, which has reference number Alpha 030, then it will count towards the IAW award. Ed states that he doesn't have a dedicated QSL card for GB0KSS, but he's happy to QSL direct or via the Bureau to Mike Zero Mike November Golf for one of his own cards. You can find out more about International Air Ambulance Week by visiting www.radio-amateur.events.org forward slash IAW and details of the award are there too. Over in Austria, members of the radio club Oscar Echo 3 X-Ray Alpha Sierra will be activating special event station Oscar Echo 130 Kilo Uniform Kilo between September the 1st and October the 30th to commemorate the 130th anniversary of the first telegraphy course in the Franz Josef Kassern Barracks in Thun. KUK stands for Imperial and Royal. In 1891, a cavalry telegraphist course was first established in the Imperial and Royal Franz Josef Kassen Barracks in Thun, located in Lower Austria. At the time, Austria was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. QSLs will be sent automatically via the Bureau, and you can check planned operating times for OE130KUK at www.oe3ide.com. The Northern California DX Foundation has donated $100,000 to the upcoming 3Y0J, the expedition to Bouvet Island, which is set for late 2022. The de-expedition will be carried out by Amateur Radio De-Expeditions, a Norwegian nonprofit organization created for the purpose of conducting de-expeditions. The Northern California DX Foundation is now the de-expeditions lead sponsor. We wish to recognize and thank the Northern California DX Foundation as the lead sponsor for our 3Y0J de-expedition to Bouvet, the 3Y0J team said. Without the support of the Northern California DX Foundation, operations to the world's rarest entities would be difficult. A dependency of Norway, Bouvet is a sub-Antarctic island in the South Atlantic. It is the second most wanted DXCC entity behind North Korea. 
The 3Y0J team said that with its overall budget of $650,000, this de-expedition to Bouvet will be the most expensive ever. With the Northern California DX Foundation donation, we hope to succeed in the fundraising as our first payment milestone for the vessel contract is approaching, the team said. About a third of the vessel contract is due by the end of October, and the de-expedition said it wants to have confidence that it can succeed financially. We critically need upfront donations to be able to make it. While we have a solid plan, a young and strong team, a dedicated crew, and the vessel Marama, we need your support to go there and make 120,000 QSOs from Cape Phi at Bouvet. Three co-leaders are heading up the de-expedition. They are Ken Opskar, LA-7-GIA, Ruin Oye, LA-7-THA, and Erwan Marian, LB-1-QI. Donations to the 3Y0J de-expedition are invited via PayPal or through the 3Y0J website. Visit the 3Y0 de-expedition Facebook page. In June, the Intrepid DX Group announced that it was canceling its long-anticipated de-expedition to Bouvet Island after it lost its vessel contract. Veron, the Netherlands Amateur Radio Society, reports that a good number of radio amateurs took part in the Reduced Bandwidth Digital Amateur Television Contest held on August the 21st to 22nd in the 50, 144 and 430 MHz bands. The still almost brand new DATV contest on 6 meters, 2 meters and 70 cms looked forward to a lot of interest. There were no special propagation conditions and according to some, the conditions were poor. Nevertheless, during the contest, connections were made over considerable distances. These were mainly north-south connections. While a few years ago there was only a single station with DATV in the north of the Netherlands, there are now many more. There were again a large number of European stations on the band for the contest. Some came on just for a short period of time, but others were operational almost all day. Only at night was it quieter. The BATC DX spot was heavily used to spot activity, especially for 2 meters and 70 sems. As mentioned, the conditions were nothing to write home about. However, considerable distances were worked. Patrick, Oscar November 1, Bravo Tango Echo, and Jack, Papa Alpha Zero, Bravo Oscar Juliet were very active. Some of the digital connections worked straight away. Sometimes it took a while, and sometimes it just didn't work. But in general, there was a lot of useful experimentation again. One of the things that stood out for Paul, Papa Alpha 3, Bravo, Yankee Victor, was how much fading, also known as QSB, can be on a DATV signal and how many different types of QSB there was. Aircraft scatter, windmills, and probably also atmospheric effects all contributed to fading. Reflections and multipath effects also played a role here. What was happening on 50 MHz during the contest could not be seen on BATC's DX spot, but on inquiry there had probably only been some activity in the Amsterdam area. So there's still a lot to achieve for future activity. Apparently not many amateurs have their equipment in order for 6 meters yet. You can read the full post on the Veron website at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Netherlands. And the BATC DX spot is at dxspot.batc.org.uk. Two Russian cosmonauts will venture outside the International Space Station Friday, September 3rd and Thursday, September 9th to conduct the first pair of up to 11 spacewalks to prepare the new NAWQA Multipurpose Laboratory module for operations in space. NASA will provide live coverage for both spacewalks or extravehicular activities on NASA television, the NASA app, and the agency's website. Coverage Friday, September 3rd, will begin at 10 a.m. EDT, with the spacewalk scheduled to begin at approximately 10.35 a.m., and coverage Thursday, September 9th, begins at 10.30 a.m., with the spacewalk expected to begin about 11 a.m. The first spacewalk called Russian EVA-49 could last up to seven hours, while the second spacewalk, Russian EVA-50, is scheduled to last about five hours. Expedition 65 flight engineers 
Oleg Novitsky and Pyotr Dobrov of Roscosmos will exit the Poisk module on the space-facing side of the station's Russian segment. During the spacewalks, the cosmonauts will install handrails on NACA and connect power, Ethernet, and data cables between the recently arrived module and the Zevzda service module. Novitsky, who is designated as Extra Vehicular Crew Member 1, will wear the Russian Orlan spacesuit with the red stripes. Dubrov will wear the spacesuit with the blue stripes as Extra Vehicular Crew Member 2. These will be the second and third spacewalks for both cosmonauts. The 242nd and 243rd spacewalks in support of Space Station Assembly, Maintenance and Upgrades, and the 10th and 11th spacewalks at the station in 2021. NACA launched on a Russian Proton-M rocket on July 21st from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and docked automatically to the Earth facing Zevzda port July 29th. ARRL members in the New England and Roanoke divisions will choose among three candidates running for director in each division. The candidates include two incumbents. Those are the only contested races in this year's election cycle for director and vice director. In the New England division, the candidates for director are the incumbent, Fred Hoppengarten, K1VR of Lincoln, Massachusetts, Tom Frenet, K1KI of West Suffield, Connecticut, and Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC of Hollis, New Hampshire. New England Vice Director Phil Temples, K9HI of Watertown, Massachusetts, was uncontested and has been declared elected. In the Roanoke Division, the candidates for director are the incumbent, George Bud Hippisley, W2RU of Pennock, Virginia, and challengers James Boner, N2ZZ of Aiken, South Carolina, and Marvin Hoffman, WA4NC of Boone, North Carolina. No one challenged Roanoke Division Vice Director Bill Marine, N2COP of Wilmington, North Carolina, and he has been declared elected for a new term. Incumbent directors and vice directors in the ARRL Central, Hudson, and Northwestern Divisions also had no challengers and have been declared elected. In the Central Division, Carl Lusselschwab, K9LA of Fort Wayne, Indiana, and Vice Director Brent Walls, N9BA of Greenfield, Indiana, will continue in their respective posts. In the Hudson Division, Director Rhea Jairam, N2RJ of Sussex, New Jersey, and Vice Director Bill Hudzik, W2UDT of Gillette, New Jersey, are unchallenged in this election cycle and have been declared elected. In the Northwestern Division, Director Mike Ritz, W7VO of Scapoose, Oregon, and Vice Director Mark Tharp, KB7HDX of Yakima, Washington, also faced no challengers in their re-election bids. Full ARRL members of the New England and Roanoke divisions, who are in good standing as of September 10, 2021, will receive a ballot. Ballots will be mailed to members no later than October 1, 2021. Completed ballots must be received at the designated P.O. Box in the envelope provided by noon Eastern Time Friday, November 19th, 2021. Catherine Forson, KT5KMF, is the recipient of the 2021 ARRL Hiram Percy Maxim Memorial Award. Increasing the interest and participation in amateur radio of these younger than 21 remains a primary effort of ARRL. Underscoring that focus is ARRL's annual bestowing of its premier award on a younger member whose contributions to both amateur radio and her local community embody the ideals of amateur radio service. With more on this year's recipient, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. The recipient of ARRL's prestigious Hiram Percy Maxim Memorial Award for 2021 is Catherine Forson, KT5KMF of Plano, Texas, a technician in 2013 at the age of nine, a general in 2017, and an amateur extra in 2018. Catherine's enthusiasm resulted in her appointment as the North Texas Section Youth Coordinator in 2019. 
She's an active member of the Plano Amateur Radio Club and Collin County Races and a trained National Weather Service Skywarn storm spotter. She participates as an amateur radio operator in public service events such as the Plano Balloon Festival. When not on the radio, Catherine is active in her school and community. She's a senior at Plano West Senior High School where she has a 4.46 grade point average and is a member of the National Honor Society, the Spanish Honor Society, and her high school band. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. She won second place in the Dallas Regional Science and Engineering Fair and placed second in the Physics and Astronomy category at the Texas State Science and Engineering Fair. She serves as a children's lector at her church and is a Dallas Meals on Wheels volunteer. The Hiram Percy Maxim Memorial Award consists of a $1,500 cash award and an engraved plaque. Western Golf Division Director John Robert Stratton, N5AUS, and North Texas Section Manager Stephen Smith, KG5VK, will present Catherine with her award at the September 20th, 2021 meeting of the Plano Amateur Radio Club. Most amateurs know what solar storms can do to our plans for DX, or even a friendly rack chew when they mess with the Earth's geomagnetic field. Well, according to one California researcher, internet users could soon also be faced with solar outages. If you rely on the internet as much as you rely on your amateur radio, you may have twice as many reasons for being wary of space weather, according to a California professor, Sagita Abdu Joti, a computer scientist at the University of California at Irvine, she believes that the major solar storms are capable of co compromising the internet global infrastructure, especially under sea cables. It's not that a coronal mass ejection can disable the fiber optic cables that form the foundation of the internet. They can't. Those cables remain unaffected and local internet service would remain intact. But the researchers said a global network of undersea communications cables that boost the internet's international signals the equivalent of repeaters could suffer directly from the electromagnetic fluctuations brought on by severe solar eruptions. In a recently released research paper, the professor speculated that this could knock nations off the internet, isolating them for as long as several weeks. The professor presented her findings in a paper in late August at a conference held virtually by the Association for Computer Machinery. She noted that astrophysicists say that there is a likelihood between 1.6% and 12% that a strong enough storm of this sort will occur within the next decade. For many, her findings describe a future version of the Carrington event, a geomagnetic storm in September of 1859 that damaged the Earth's ozone layer and disrupted telegraph lines around the world. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, has the following employment opportunities at ARRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. The following job titles are available. Acquisitions Editor, Assistant Marketing Manager, Director of Emergency Management, Director of Information Technology, Lab Engineer, EMC, RFI Specialist, Membership Manager, Public Relations and Outreach Manager, and Social Media Strategist. Qualified candidates are invited to email a cover letter and resume to ARRL Human Resources. Visit the ARRL Employment Opportunities page for more information. ARRL is an equal opportunity employer. Dennis Delta Oscar One Delta Sierra Hotel in Germany reports that it's been announced in Germany's Federal Law Gazette that the cost of amateur radio exams will be sharply reduced from October 1, 2021. The cost of the Class E exam, which is equivalent to the UK intermediate level, has been cut from 80 to 56 euros. The Class A exam, which is equivalent to the full UK qualification, has been cut from 110 to 71.5 euros. The regulator's call sign assignment charge has been cut from 70 to 20 euros. The father-daughter cycling ham radio team of Kevin Richardson, G0PEK, and Lauren Richardson, 2E Oscar HLR, have come to their journey's end. Their megacycle expedition finished as planned on August 25th in Northern Ireland. Starting at Land's End, it was a 28-day trek of more than 1,700 kilometers or 1,056 miles, 
and was a fundraiser for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. They also raised contacts along the way via amateur radio using their home call signs while on VHF, UHF during the day and using MX0KRO, the call sign of the Kent Active Radio Amateurs Group when camping. Hams and non-hams alike follow them on Twitter and their Megacycle Expedition Facebook page where they got to see the two adventurers reach their finish line in, in Northern Scotland. Their duo even participated in International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend operating on HF from the lighthouse at Cape Wrath. Reports suggest that jamming stations that have been deployed on the lower portion of 40 meters. The jamming appears to be coming from Cuba. The signals, spaced at regular intervals, exhibit a squishy, popping noise. The apparent jamming showed up after anti-government protesters took to the streets of Cuba, followed by a government crackdown. So far, there's no proven connection between the jamming and the protests, as evidence has been circumstantial. DX spots suggest that Cuban hams are on the air on SSB, but do appear rare on 40 meters. A lot of Cuban spots point to FT8 activity. The jamming issue has drawn the attention of the FCC, which is looking into the matter, according to one tech publication. Too many people around the world are fighting uphill battles to be able to use technology to expand economic opportunity, express themselves, and organize without fear of reprisal, an FCC spokesperson told the tech publication Motherboard. The FCC is committed to supporting the free flow of information and ensuring that the Internet remains open for everyone. We are assessing these reports in conjunction with our field agents and communicating with the Department of State as this issue develops. Outside of ham radio, the ability to connect with some social media sites and even with the Internet inside Cuba has been reportedly tricky. Connecting to the Federación de Radioaficionados de Cuba website, Cuba's IARU member society from outside of Cuba has been unreliable. This week, users attempting to do so, at least those in the United States, got a shrugging cartoon character and the legend, Acceso Denegado, Access Denied. The FRC Facebook page is accessible, but links to the FRC website are blocked. FRC had warned of possible outages a short time ago, attributing the problem to maintenance being done in the data center where the FRC website is housed. Well-known amateur radio contester and DXer Fred Laun, K3ZO, pointed out back in July in a post to the Potomac Valley Radio Club Reflector, said that typical ham radio contacts with Cuba are not normally about politics, though I suppose in the wake of recent events they may have become so. Josh Nass, KI6NAZ of the YouTube channel Ham Radio Crash Course, is calling the interference the Cuban Rum Runner, an oblique reference to the Russian woodpecker of yesteryear. And Matthew Keskavich, K0LWC recorded an emergency broadcast message on his YouTube channel to advise viewers of the purported jamming. International Amateur Radio Union Region 2, the Americas, President Ramon Santoyo, XE1KK, said no complaints had been received during the last month. The University of Surrey cybersecurity expert, Professor Alan Woodward, has been talking about his new satellite broadband service from space entrepreneur Elon Musk's Starlink company. He said that it had actually been very good, but he noticed a series of outages, some for just a second, some longer. The outages, he thinks, may be caused by a lot of pesky pigeons, which have taken a fancy to sitting on his dish. The small grey dish sits on his kitchen roof. Due to its strange shape and near vertical elevation, to a curious pigeon it might conceivably look like a modern bird bath rather short on water. It is the earthbound end of the Starlink satellite internet system. Living in a place where he can only dream of a fibre broadband connection, Professor Woodward said he's pleased to be one of the beta testers of the low earth orbit satellite broadband system. Mr Musk recently announced that he had already shipped 100,000 of the terminals.
The little dish receives and sends signals to passing satellites, part of a constellation of 1,700, which are hurtling overhead at a height of about 340 miles. They travel fast enough to orbit the Earth every 90 minutes or so. Tens of thousands more are planned, but Gwyn Shotwell, president of aerospace company SpaceX, which operates Starlink, has admitted new launches are being affected by shortages of chips and liquid oxygen fuel. Treating COVID-19 patients has increased demand for commercial oxygen supplies, leaving less for rocket fuel. Professor Woodward is still investigating the root cause of the glitches, though an expert told the BBC that a pigeon sitting on a Starlink antenna would certainly degrade its performance. Pigeons have not been the only problem, however, as this week a major outage hit Starlink users all around the world. The connection, Professor Woodward said, just completely disappeared. The service, still officially in beta testing phase, seems to have been down for about an hour for many users, and Starlink have not explained why. You can read more at www.bbc.co.uk, navigate to the Technology News section. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. You can visit the ARRL Learning Network page to register, check on upcoming webinars, ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. Introduction to DMR and Digital Voice by Tim Deegan, KJ8U, will be presented on Thursday, September 9, 2021, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, that's 1930. UTC, an introductory overview of digital voice technologies for ham radio. Focus on DMR with notes on System Fusion, D-Star, and other digital voice modes. Description of digital voice architecture components and the interesting opportunities as well as the challenges it presents amateur radio operators will be covered. Working the Pileup, presented by Ron Del Pierre Smith. KD9IPO is scheduled for a presentation on Tuesday, October 5th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Ron Del Pierre Smith, KD9IPO, Vice President of the Chicago Suburban Radio Association and an ARRL Assistant Section Manager in Illinois, will offer an enlightening discussion on working a pileup from both sides of the contact. Whether your interest lies in field day, contesting, special events, or Rare DX, this is a must-see presentation. Ron will discuss search and pounce and running techniques, when to use them, and some tips on working them to your advantage. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change, so check the Learning Network webinar page for the latest schedule updates. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Mounting repeater antennas upside down. When you're a repeater owner and you have the opportunity to move your system to a new tower, sometimes the mounting site you are offered is an upside down mount. This means your antenna will be hanging upside down from the way it's designed. Water can become a real problem in this instance. From time to time, I've had to deal with these placements too. Over the years, I have talked to technical people at different antenna manufacturers and run into the same methods of modifying antennas for upside down mounting. Generally, a fiberglass shroud encased antenna needs to be modified with the addition of two small holes you drill yourself. A 1 8 inch hole near the top cap or in the side near the top end will drain any water in the main body of the antenna. Those antennas that have a separate mount which consists of an aluminum tube with two clamps and a set screw, then the coax is fed through the tube and attached directly to the bottom of the antenna. You will need to drill another hole near the level of the connector this will allow water to drain from the mounting tube instead of entering into the antenna body by way of the coax connector. Now you've modified your antenna for upside down mounting. There's one more problem. You'll need to seal the top end of the mounting tube to keep rainwater from entering in the first place. Here, I use silicone caulk. Be careful not to get any on the coax connector hardware. 
some silicone cure systems can attack copper. I build a seal around the tube and the coax and apply more to the coax to form a small mound above the bottom of the mounting tube. After the caulking cures, you can add another sealant like coax seal for added protection. Don't forget to secure the coax during the curing time so holes don't form in the silicone plug you've just made. I've known of people using flaps cut from truck tire inner tubes to cover the entrance of the coax into the mounting tube. This also keeps sunlight off the silicone and is known to be very long lasting. The best philosophy is to use a few layers of protection, making sure each one is chemically different from the others. So if one fail, the others are different and more likely to survive. Here's a common repeater antenna failure I've seen. The common practice is to use a short jumper coax to go between the antenna and the upper end of the hard line. Be sure to secure as much of it to the antenna mount or sidearm. You want the jumper to move with the tower, antenna, and mounting hardware, but not flex much on its own. One of the most common failures I have seen in repeater systems is improperly installed jumper cable. The most common failure was flexing caused by the wind breaking the outer conductor of the coax jumper. Perhaps you've encountered some others. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. On Saturday, September 11th, everyone's invited to the Asheville Radio Museum in North Carolina to help it mark two decades of preserving radio history. What grew into a regional home for radio history of all kinds began with founders Clint Gorman, K4KRB, and the late Carl Smith, N4AA. Carl and his wife Miriam rescued a 1930s era radio receiver in need of repair. Miriam, who was also a ham, then suggested they add it to their collection with the help of some other ham operators. Out of that grew an exhibit that became the Southern Appalachian Radio Museum. Now the museum, located on a college campus, showcases all facets of radio technology, from cell phones and Bluetooth to GPS, and of course vintage commercial and amateur radios. There's even an early 1900 spark gap transmitter for Morse code. The public celebration is from noon to 3 p.m. on the campus of the Asheville Buncombe Technical College, and details are available on the museum's website. Purdue University innovators have created technology aimed at replacing Morse code with colored digital characters to modernize optical storage. They are confident the advancement will help with the explosion of remote data storage during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Morse code has been around since the 1830s. The familiar dots and dashes system may seem antiquated, giving the amount of information needed to be acquired, digitally archived, and rapidly accessed every day, but those same basic dots and dashes are still used in many optical media to aid in storage. A new technology developed at Purdue is aimed at modernizing the optical digital storage technology. This advancement allows for more data to be stored and for that data to be read at a quicker rate. The research is published in Laser and Photonics Reviews. Rather than using the traditional dots and dashes as commonly used in these technologies, the Purdue innovators encode information in the angular position of tiny antennas, allowing them to store more data per unit area. The storage capacity greatly increases because it is only defined by the resolution of the sensor by which you can determine the angular positions of antennas, said Alexander Kildeshev, an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering in Purdue's College of Engineering. We map the antenna angles into colors, and the colors are decoded. Technology has aided in increasing storage space availability in optical digital storage technologies. Not all optical data storage media needs to be laser writable or rewritable. The majority of CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray discs are stamped and not recordable at all. This class of optical media is an essential part of disposable cold storage with a rapid access rate, long-lasting shelf life, and excellent archival capabilities. The making of a Blu-ray disc is based on the pressing process, where the silicon stamper replicates the same dot and dashes format the final disc is getting. A thin nickel coating is then added to get a negative stamp. The Blu-rays, as well as DVDs and CDs, are just mass-produced. Our metasurface-based optical storage is just like that, said Dai Wang, a former PhD student who fabricated the prototype structure. Whereas in our demo prototype, the information is burnt in by electron beam lithography, it could be replicated by a more scalable manufacturing process in the final product. This new development not only allows for more information to be stored, but also increases the readout rate. 
You can put four sensors nearby, and each sensor would read its own polarization of light, Kildeshev said. This helps increase the speed of readout of information compared to the use of a single sensor with dots and dashes. Future applications for this technology include security tagging and cryptography. To continue developing these capabilities, the team is looking to partner with interested parties in the industry. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Letter, the AWRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the KD5DMT 145.290 and 443.025 MHz repeater system in Centerton and Garfield, Arkansas. Owned and operated by the Benton County Radio Operators Club, serving Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri, and Northeast Oklahoma. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.